This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. Blessed Sunday and Easter to you. I have for you today the final part of our look at Monsignor Ronald Knox's examination of the various parts and petitions of the Our Father, the Pater Noster. Here he goes into the final petition. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What it means. Spoiler alert, it does not mean what you think it means. It's not a petition to avoid temptation in the modern sense. And he goes into what that means. What did our Lord and the people who listened to him, what would they have meant when they heard the, when they used or heard the word temptation? I think you will find that the prayer for our times is the Our Father. This is something I might consider really doing on my own later, is really doing a video on how the Our Father is the prayer for our times in a world spinning out of control. You look at the headlines, you'll know what I mean, especially on the international geopolitical scene. But enough for me. Monsignor Ronald Knox. Our deliverance. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. By Monsignor Ronald Knox. To the very end, the Pater Noster preserves the curious character we have already noticed of being very simple on the surface, and yet plunging us into deep waters of theological speculation the moment we begin to look into it. In these concluding words, we come across an actual problem of interpretation, to which no certain answer can be given. Owing to an ambiguity in the Greek, it is not absolutely clear whether we ask to be delivered from evil, or from the evil one, that is the devil. It may be said that that does not make much difference, but what does make a difference, I think, as we repeat the prayer day after day, is a question which is apt to present itself to our minds. What is the evil I am asking to be delivered from? Am I simply saying the same thing twice over, praying that I may not be led into temptation, but rather that I may be delivered from sin? Or are there two separate petitions, one asking that I may, may not be led into temptation, but rather may be delivered from sin? Or are there two separate petitions, one asking that I may not be led into temptations, which would be hurtful to my soul, and the other that I may be delivered from the various evils, pain, sickness, poverty, disappointment, and so on, which threaten my earthly happiness. We have not finished our exposition of this greatest of all prayers until we have made some effort to discover what our Lord's mind was about this. Perhaps there is no word familiar to Christian piety which has altered its meaning so much with the centuries as the word temptation. At least it has not exactly altered its meaning, but it has lost a great deal of its early force. When we consider the clause, Thy kingdom come, I suggested that we should do well to put ourselves in the position of those who were listening to our Lord as he spoke, that we should try to imagine what picture the phrase called up in their minds. Perhaps it would be well if we did the same here. Did our Lord's immediate audience understand by the word temptation anything like what we understand by it? I don't think there is any probability that they did. What do we mean by the term? I suppose that the ordinary modern Christian, if he were asked to give an instance of what he meant by temptation, would say something like this. If I were very hard up for money and somebody who was walking in front of me in a lonely street dropped a pound note without realizing that he had dropped it, then my duty would be to restore it to him, but I should be tempted to put it in my pocket instead. Quite so, that would be a very fair example. When we say we are tempted, we mean that there is a bias in our corrupt nature which inclines us to gratify the claims of our own appetite, our own self-interest, although we know that in doing so we should be disobeying God's will. But if you watch the usage of the word in the Bible, you will hardly ever find it bears the sense we have been giving it. In the Old Testament, the word scarcely occurs at all. In the New Testament, I think you can say its normal meaning is rather what we call a trial. We say that some friend has, got, has had great trials to undergo, meaning that he has met with suffering, and such suffering as was fitted to test his character. To test his patience is the main idea. Very often we forget about the part of it and simply say, my cook is a great trial or something of that kind. But this is to use words in a wrong sense. A trial means something unpleasant which befalls us in such a way, as to test our patience. Theologically speaking, it means something unpleasant which is allowed to befall us in order that it may test our patience. And that is ordinarily what is meant when you get the word temptation in the New Testament. That and nothing else. When St. Paul, for instance, talks about temptations, 
which he encounters owing to the plots which the elder brothers laid against him. Or when St. Peter or St. James tells us that we ought to rejoice when we meet with temptations. Or when St. John in the Apocalypse writes of the hour of temptation which will come to test every man on earth. You will see at once that they do not refer to temptations in our sense. They refer to what we call trials. And when our Lord himself bids his disciples in Gethsemane watch and pray that they may not enter into temptation, he clearly means they are to pray that the supreme test which is about to undergo may not be a test for them also. You who he says to them elsewhere are they who have been with me in my temptations, who have shared all the hardships and all the disappointments which have tested and proved my love for mankind. I suppose, then, that there is little doubt what our Lord was understood to mean by those who first heard him use the words, Lead us not into temptation. They were expecting the dawn of a messianic kingdom, the kingdom foretold by the prophets, but those same prophets had warned them that it would only come at the end of a period of great affliction, for God's people especially. We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. That was the belief of the elder brothers in our Lord's time as it was the belief of the first Christians. Nor was there any reason why our Lord should correct these misgivings. For he knew well that his followers, a very short time after his death, would be subjected to persecution everywhere. Knew that Jerusalem would be destroyed in circumstances unexampled horror, and that the Christians of Judea would only save themselves by fleeing from the invading Roman army. Looking forward, then, to a world in which his friends would have much tribulation, would be tested, tried in the fire at the imminent risk of losing their faith and denying his name. He taught them to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The two clauses offered a single petition. They were to pray that they might escape as far as possible the evils that were coming on their generation. In the first clause was the explanation of the second. They were to hope for a way of escape from these temporal evils, for fear that the temptation, the trial, the test of their faith might be too strong for them, or fear that they should lose all, and involve themselves in eternal misery as the result. Deliver us from evil, lest by it we should be led into temptation. That, I think, will have been the order in which these two petitions will have been understood by the minds of those who first used them. Have they no meaning, so understood for later ages? There have been few periods of history at which the world was not moved among pre presentiments of evil. Men swooning away for fear and expectation of what shall come upon the earth. They have not always interpreted these symptoms as the first Christians often did, mistaking them for signs of an approaching disillusion of the world order. But they have felt the old landmarks slipping away from them and recoiled in terror from the unimaginable prospect of what must follow if things went from bad to worse. We have been living these last few months, some of us much longer than that, in a state of eager anxiety, lest the bottom should fall out of our world and strange forces be let loose, which would replace its ordered structure by chaos. And although, as we saw, our Lord does not want us to indulge our imaginations in solicitous questionings about the future, he does mean us to pray, I think, quietly and steadily, for the averting of those evils, which for all our trust in his providence we can yet see as it were, out of the corner of our eyes. A new order of the ages, more profound in its consequences than the last, a revolution on a worldwide scale, a general breakdown of that complicated economic system by which the modern world so precariously husbands its resources. With these and a score of other nightmares, our busy publicists try to cheat us out of our rest at nights. What attitude are we to adopt towards them, as we say, the pater noster, before we go to bed? We have prayed already for the coming of God's kingdom, for the fulfillment of his will rather than ours. We have tried to put things in their proper scale by reminding ourselves, by trying to make ourselves understand, that God's will is the only thing which matters, that our wills only find their true focus when they identify themselves with his. We have prayed for our daily bread, for the simple provision which will just last us out over the period of time which lies immediately behind, beneath our eyes, leaving the further vista of the future shaded from us by his merciful hand. But with all that, we cannot entirely dismiss from our view the agitations which crowd in upon us every time we catch sight of a newspaper or join in a discussion with our friends on public affairs. So we will pray about it from God's point of view, as it were, not from ours. We will ask that the world may be delivered from such perils as imagination conjures up for us. But the chief motive which inspires us in doing so shall be not the comfort or the convenience of ourselves and our friends, or the order or the nation to which we belong, 
but God's glory. It is because these world catastrophes lead so many of our weak fellow mortals into temptation, put a strain on their faith, which it will not stand, that we want them not to happen. Let the weaker brethren, and who knows what we may ourselves be among their number, should be tempted to despair and to blaspheme God and to fall away into a selfish materialism, which allows no place for him. We will pray for the world to be delivered from such general evils as it apprehends. We fear not so much these evils in themselves as the effects they are likely to bring. It may be that before a year has passed over our heads, public confidence will somehow have been restored, and we shall be facing the future with brighter hearts. If so, we shall not have the same reason for praying to be delivered from evil. The anticipation of it will be less close to our doors. Shall we on that account have the less reason to pray that we may not be led into temptation? Alas, no. The devil has more ways than one of working upon human inconstancy. Temptation for us has more meanings than one, and we should do ill to forget it. Those of us who can remember the atmosphere of the Great War can remember all the promises we made to ourselves and to one another that this lesson should never be forgotten. That if God would give us peace again, his world should never slip back into its old habits of selfishness and indifference. God gave us peace and prosperity came back with it. Did England, did the world profit by it? By delivering us from the evil, he did lead us out of temptation. Ask the recording angels. They will tell you, I fear, that our sins have never so cried for vengeance as in the days of our fullness, after the world had found peace. Let us think once more of ourselves, and ask of ourselves individually whether prosperity is always good for us, whether our deliverance from evil always engages us to such gratitude as would make us rise superior to the temptations of the world, the flesh and the devil. The question is no sooner asked than answered. We know how seldom, when all goes well with us in this world, all goes well with our immortal souls. We need then a twofold construction for this final clause of the Pater Noster. We are to pray that our weakness may be preserved from temptation, by whatever means. Deliver us, Lord, from evil, lest evil should bring us into temptation. Deliver us, Lord, from evil, unless thou seest that such evil is necessary for us, that no other remedy can save us from falling into temptation but suffering, but anxieties, but insecurity here. Our Father, Father of all mankind, Father to whom we owe all our being, who dost preserve life in us at each moment, who dost correct and chasten us with a Father's love, hallowed be thy name. Let us not dare to approach thee until we have put away from us the mean thoughts of earth, the king, thy kingdom come in us and in all thy creation. Whether thou wilt soon put an end to this time of conflict and probation, or wilt prolong it until thou seest us more worthy to meet thy presence. Thy will be done rather than ours, and if ours only because it is thine. Although we cannot understand on earth why it was thy will, as we shall understand it one day in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. We are not afraid to ask thee for earthly benefits, only we will not ask for more than the needs of the day. Because we love to cast our care on thee, who dost feed us with the super substantial bread of eternal life. Forgive us our trespasses as our own individual sins, and all those sins of our fellow men for which thy Immaculate Mother intercedes. And when thou forgivest, teach us to forgive our fellow men with a generosity which finds its model in thee. Deliver us from evils that will be too strong a test for our imperfect faith, but not from those evils that will preserve us from the temptation to forget thee. Amen. O Lord, so be it as thou wilt, as thou hast taught us to pray, so pray our prayer in us now and all the days of our life. Amen. And that was Monsignor Ronald Knox speaking on the meaning of the Our Father, specifically the final petition of lead us not into temptation. And I think that was a very important one, at least for me, <laughs> given everything going on in my life right now. <laughs> but uh, in general, I think people do not understand what the temptations were that he was that were meant in the penning of our Father by our Lord. And it's good for us to have really under some context for that, because Monsignor Knox is correct. The our you know the apostles and the disciples when taught the Our Father would not have understood the word temptation the way we do today. It's sort of like the accusation that Protestants make that Catholics worship Mary. We say, no, we don't. And then we go into a veneration versus adoration and hyperdulia conversation. Except, of course, there are prayers out there that say things like, oh, blessed virgin, we worship you. Literally says that. Where does that misunderstanding come from? They redefine the term worship. Protestants did in the English-speaking world. That is objectively true because the English-speaking world is mostly Protestant. 
at least it was, culturally. And they redefined the term worship. And I don't think they did it on purpose. But when they hear worship, and they, it, what we do with the Virgin Mary sounds and looks an awful lot like worship to them because of how they define the term. So it's good to go back to ancient terms so we are all on the same page, especially with the words of our Lord, what he meant in context. This is why some of the really most interesting writings today are about context. And I don't mean what the modernists do, because there are anti-modernist writers who go back to what early worship looked like and give you some context on where our worship comes from today, and they come to very different conclusions than the modernists do. But anyway, getting too verbose here for a Sunday morning. <laughs> Let me know what you thought of this in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. Sharing this on social media helps a lot, too. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.